Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled Twin Century Fiction where we're looking at Virginia Woolf's novel Mrs. Dalloway. So this will be the last lecture on this novel after which we'll move on to a new text. So uh, we ended in the last lecture how the word must is, uh, it carries some symbolic significance because uh, we keep hearing that the doctors tell Septimus that he must be taught to rest. So there's a, it's a very violent vocabulary, there's a lot of violence in the rhetoric of the doctors, the medical rhetoric, the vocabulary, it, it is embedded in violence. Uh, it is quite uh, you know, aggressive in that, in, in that sense. Now the word must obviously means that there is a degree of coercion as well, so that the patients are coerced into confinement, coerced into resting, etc. Now the final scene which we will study in this particular section, it, it is a scene of Septimus' suicide uh, when he jumps from the window and that becomes in a sense his only, uh, <clears throat> the only available agency for him, right? The, the uh, whole agency of committing suicide, I mean he, he does it because he realizes he's, he's trapped, he's confined uh, and, and the doctors come in like invaders. And uh, the image obviously is a very violent image, the, the vocabulary is very violent and the doctors appear like soldiers coming in to take him away uh, and presumably uh, put him in some kind of a corrective uh, regimen which doesn't want to be a part of. Okay, so uh, and just prior to that we see how Septimus and Razia they talk about how they should be inseparable, they should never be away from each other at any cost. Uh, so that becomes obviously uh, that uh, the good sense of sentimental attachment, uh, romantic attachment, empathetic attachment, uh, and empathy is something which is visibly, conspicuously absent uh, in entire medical discourse that these people are um, sort of exercising. Uh, the doctors, Holmes and Bradshaw. Okay, so. Uh, <clears throat> So this section is just a continuation from where we ended last time um, and she said nothing should separate them. She sat down beside him and called him by a name of the hawk or crow which being malicious and a great destroyer of crops was precisely like him, right? So this, and this analogy is interesting, uh, he's been called a crow or, or a hawk, uh, it's almost like a, you know, a destructive bird, something which comes in uh, as a predator bird. No one could separate them, she said. Then she got up to go to the bedroom to pick the things, but hearing voices downstairs and thinking the Dr. Holmes had perhaps called, ran down to prevent him coming up. So this becomes a, a really intense scene now. Uh, she hears Dr. Holmes come in and she wants to go down to prevent him, to stop him from coming up. And he's obviously come with a crew of people, he's come with some people and uh, uh, you know they, they obviously want to take Septimus away. So the entire intention is one of violence, the entire intention is one of coercion away. And which is what uh, it, it, it does Septimus in uh, emotionally even more. Septimus could hear her talking to Holmes on a staircase. My dear lady, I've come as a friend, Holmes was saying. No, I'll not allow you to see my husband, she said. So again, this becomes uh, almost like a forcible thing. So Holmes wants to come in, I come here as a friend. So you know, there's a sinister quality about that statement, I come here as a friend. Uh, that obviously means there's some implications over here which are non-friendly or unfriendly, perhaps hostile, perhaps he comes in as something who, who somebody who has an intention, has a motive to take away this uh, dysfunctional soldier, right? So it sounds like one of those Harold Pinter plays where uh, a mysterious agent of the state comes and takes away people that are dysfunctional. So if we think of, let's say, uh, the birthday party for instance, uh, where uh, the figure of Stanley is washed off, washed away, uh, you know, washed out, sorry, washed out pianist is taken away by two mysterious people who come in a black van to take him away. Something similar is happening here. So Holmes comes in very mysteriously, very sinisterly uh, and says, I come here as a friend uh, and obviously uh, Rezia does her best to stop him from coming. And uh, Septimus overhears the entire thing from upstairs and that's uh, what obviously traumatizes him even more. My dear lady, I've come as a friend, Holmes was saying. No, I'm not allowed to see my husband, she said. He could see her like a little hen with the wings spread, barring his passage, but Holmes persevered. My dear lady, allow me, Holmes said, putting her aside, Holmes was a powerfully built man. So again, the masculinity over here is interesting. Um, the masculinity is here is aggressive, is uh, formidable, is sinister. 
in quality and he pushes her away. And again, this obviously becomes a very symbolic movement because pushing her away, pushing the patient away, pushing the patient's will away is a very clear uh, indication of the complete lack of agency exhibited by or, or experienced by the patient when the doctors decide when is the time to come and the doctors decide to take them away, the doctors decide to do the things which they think are right for the patient, which often uh, uh, which often entails, it often includes corporeal confinement. So, the degree of corporeal fear, uh, the viscerality, the corporeality of the fear is something which is uh, dramatized over here. Holmes coming up the stairs, uh, Razia trying her best to stop him from coming, and Satman is overhearing the entire thing from upstairs. And obviously, Holmes, um, you know, trying to put her aside and walking up the stairs in order to see Septimus. Holmes was coming upstairs. Holmes would burst out, open the door. Holmes would say, in a funk, eh? So again, uh, the, the vocabulary over here is very, very uh, male, in a funk, eh? So funk obviously being a sort of depression. Uh, it's a, almost a slang, a colloquial term for depression. Something happened to you in the head. Uh, you are muddled in the head, etc. In a funk, eh? Uh, so again, there's a degree of fa fake familiarity, a very uh, fake friendliness about this particular expression in a funk. Eh? Uh, so the fakeness, uh, the phoniness uh, is obviously a continuation of the sinister quality in which he said, I come here as a friend. Uh, that was fake as well and of course that's even darker than fake, it's almost sinister in quality. In a funk, eh? Holmes would get him, but no, not Holmes, not Bradshaw. Getting up rather unsteadily, hopping instead, indeed from foot to foot, he considered Miss, Mrs. Filmer's nice clean bread knife with bread carved on the handle. Ah, but one mustn't spoil that, the gas for him. So he now looks at different, uh, uh, different weapons to kill himself, the, the bread knife. Uh, and he thinks that he bred the word uh, bred calf in the middle in the handle. Uh, and then, of course, he, it's almost like a dark comic quality about it. He thinks that if I use that to kill myself, that will spoil the knife. And it's a beautiful knife. I don't want to spoil that. So even his last thoughts are uh, very, very unsettled. The gas fire, but it's too late now. So the other thing, the other option for him would be start a gas fire and, and exhume himself, or maybe uh, suffocate himself to death. Uh, by inhaling carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide, but that would be too late. I mean, that, he doesn't have so much time because Holmes is obviously uh, climbing up the stairs. Uh, Holmes was coming, razors he might have got, but razor who always did that sort of thing had packed them. There remained only the window, the large Bloomsbury lodging house window, the tiresome, the troublesome and rather melodramatic business of opening the window and throwing himself out. Right, so it becomes a very symbolic suicide. He climbs the Bloomsbury window, uh, the typical Regency type houses in England, and it jumps from that. Right, so that almost like a symbolic, it's almost like a symbolic departure from a you know, Regency, Edward in England, uh, that has come to an end, and he becomes, uh, you know, one of these people who thought he could protect that England, and of course now that's uh, impossible. He kills himself from jumping from the window. Right, and it becomes, it's described as a very melodramatic business of opening the window and throwing himself out. It was their idea of tragedy, not his or Ezio's, for she was with him. Holmes and Bradshaw like that sort of thing. So interestingly, we see how the effect induced by the suicide is something which is more uh, akin to Holmes and Bradshaw's understanding of life and death, something very melodramatic, something very thick, something very uh, broad brushed in quality. There's no nuanced quality about this, um, uh, this kind of an act. Uh, and Septimus dislikes the fact, Septimus dislikes the fact that this suicide is more palatable to someone like Holmes and Bradshaw rather than to himself and, and, and Razia. It was their idea of tragedy, a very thick-headed idea of tragedy, a very thick, uh, uh, a heavy-handed idea of tragedy. Okay? So Holmes and Bradshaw liked that sort of thing. He sat on the sill. But he would wait till the very last moment. He did not want to die. Life was good. The sun hot. Only human beings. What did they want? Right? So again, uh, this becomes a human tragedy and the, the human quality of the tragedy is accentuated over in this particular point. He realizes, uh, we realize as readers, that the only reason why Septimus kills himself is because of his human confinement or the lack of human empathy. Everything else around him seems very nice and pleasant. The sun is hot, the birds are chirping, the city looks good, the air is nice. Uh, but, you know, the human beings are the ones who are pushing him into suicide, pushing him into uh, destruction. What did they want? So the word they comes as a collective way. Uh, it is something which is, uh, you know, put up uh, as some kind of a, you know, figure. And so they want becomes important. What did they want? So they become a collective pronoun, uh, a collective, uh, you know, category where all human beings are put together. But obviously the human beings over here mean the medical people, people who come in with this coercive, tyrannical quality, people who want to dictate and, you know, and dominate him. 
right? So what did they want? So there's a complete lack of, uh, complete collapse of communication. What did they want? Set must understand it. And so he wants to kill himself because he feels fierce, he feels pressurized, he feels persecuted by them. Coming down the staircase opposite, an old man stopped and stared at him. Her mistress at the door, I'll give, I'll give it to you, he cried, and flung himself vigorously, violently, down uh, on, uh, to Mrs. Filmer's area railings, right? So he, he jumps and, and he kills himself by uh, falling on the railings of Mrs. Filmer, right? So uh, I'll give it to you. So at the end, he becomes, it's almost like an act of violence uh, and with which he kills himself. So the entire suicide over here, it's not so much a submission, but it's, it becomes an act of uh, violent retaliation. And only retaliation possible in this uh, situation is suicide. So suicide over here is not really uh, an act of the loss of agency, but it's the final agency available to Septimus, in the, you know, according to his imagination. And so he kills himself uh, thinking that this is the only thing available for him at this point of time. The coward cried Dr. Holmes, bursting the door open. So again, this is very interesting because this obviously, uh, and it was packed with masculinity rhetoric and uh, Holmes's, uh, you know, uh, response, immediate response, a knee-jerk response to the suicide is that it's an act of cowardice. Uh, so he fails to see the emotional trauma, he fails to see the um, complete alienation suffered by Septimus over here. And the entire episode is seen as a lack of manliness by uh, uh, Dr. Holmes. So we can see how uh, it's a continuation of the military vocabulary, a continuation of the military masculinity even in a post-war metropolis. So even when the wars come to an end, even when you know, people are seemingly moving on with their civilian lives, we find how uh, someone like Septimus is still hounded by this military vocabulary of coercion and confinement and, and, and you know, judgment because the whole judgment over here by Dr. Holmes is that you know, he's a coward, Septimus is a coward, he doesn't have the, uh, the bravery, the courage to sustain life, right? So that becomes uh, the problem, that becomes uh, a disparaging remark from his end. So it's not really a medical problem, it's not really a psychological problem, it becomes a problem of masculinity according to Dr. Holmes, right? So it becomes an example of inadequate masculinity. The coward, said the uh, cried Dr. Holmes, bursting the door open, Razia ran to the window, she saw, she understood. Right, so again, the short sentences over here, uh, the short expressions over here are very, very pointed. She saw, she understood. So she saw what happened and she understood why that happened, right? So this is, in that sense, Razia and Septimus, they, all, they, they finally come together as a husband and a wife, as partners, uh, you know, who understand each other's sentiments uh, so, and so completely uh, and so, uh, so holistically. And so we have different kinds of understandings over here. There's a complete lack of understanding that is exhibited by Dr. Holmes. He doesn't see what the situation is. He thinks it's an act of unmanliness. He doesn't see the, uh, the bravery in the act actually in trying to kill himself when there's nothing else to be done. Uh, and trying to kill himself as a resistance to has been taken away and confined by medically. So it actually becomes an act of bravery. But of course he fails to see it and hence he cries coward away. But uh, Razia, she sees what happened and she understands what had happened. Dr. Holmes and Mrs. Firma collided with each other, right? So, you know, it's obviously he's coming down and Mrs. Firma is, uh, you know, they, they, they collide with each other. Mrs. Firma flapped her apron and made her hide her eyes in the bedroom. There was a great deal of running up and down stairs. Dr. Holmes came in, white as a sheet, shaking all over, with a glass in his hand. She must be brave and drink something, he said. What was it? Something sweet? For her husband was horribly mangled. So again, this very decimated body of Septimus is, is again very symbolic. It's a mangled body, it's a messy body, and that messiness of the body, the messy corporeality which Septimus's corpse uh, exhibits uh, you know, symbolically is obviously a pointer to the messiness that he experienced existentially, right? So his messy experientiality, his messy existential self is now, uh, it has a corporeal shape now. The shapelessness of the corpse is basically the shape of his confusion at the end. So her husband was horribly mangled, uh, would not recover consciousness, she must not see him, must be spared as much as possible, would have the inquest to go to a poor woman. Uh, who could have foretold it? A sudden impulse. No one was in the least to blame, he told Mrs. Felmont, and why the devil he did it, Dr. Holmes could not conceive. So again, um, if you take a look at the very masculine rhetoric over here, the woman cannot see it. The woman is obviously too nervous. The woman will become hysteric at the sight of a dead man. So she's uh, again confined away. She's taken away, corporally pushed away from her husband's dead body. She's not allowed to see it because uh, the, the doctor decides it'll be too uh, confusing, it'll be too traumatic for her. Uh, so instead, he's, she's given uh, uh, something to drink and a glass. 
But then the irony is Dr. Holmes comes in white as a sheet, shaking all over. So he's the one who's uh, you know, completely shaken by this incident. Uh, but of course, he, she, he's the one who's you know, you know, encouraging her to be brave. An assumption, of course, is that a woman cannot be brave. The woman needs an artificial stimulant, maybe something alcoholic, in order to you know, sustain this um, hysteria. Okay, and of course, the final sentence over here, uh, you know, it is very reflective. It is, um, you know, it's, it says a lot. Uh, Dr. Holmes could not conceive why the devil he did it. So again, this complete lack of understanding is exactly what is a problem uh, in Mrs. Jalloway. So the doctors do not understand why the patients behave in a certain way. The complete lack of communication, the complete crisis of communication, and uh, the lack of understanding is what, uh, you know, accentuates the trauma and isolation and alienation of these people, the sufferers. Okay, <clears throat> it seemed to her that she uh, drank the sweet stuff, that she was opening long windows, um, you know, as she drank the sweet stuff, she, that she was opening the windows, long windows, stepping out into some garden, but where? The clock was striking, one, two, three. How sensible the sound was compared with all that thumping and whispering, like Septimus himself. So again, uh, and this becomes interesting, Septimus uh, is not equated with the sensible clock, the sensible flow of time. And everything else becomes uh, unintelligent, everything else becomes, uh, you know, mere uh, foolishness. Uh, everything else, all the little micro things that you know, are heard around are becoming, uh, you know, foolish things. Septimus becomes the only sensible marker of time, the only sensible marker of meaning, right? Like the grand clock, the clock was striking. So in the end, posthumously, Septimus is equated with standardization. Septimus is uh, equated with uniformity, with sensibility, right? Okay. <clears throat> She was falling asleep, but the clock was striking four, five, six, and Mrs. Filmer waving her apron. They couldn't bring the body in here, would they? Seemed seem part of the garden or a flag. She had once seen a flag slowly rippling out of her mast when she stayed with her aunt in Venice, at Venice. Men killed in battle were the saluted, and Septimus had been through the war. Of her memories, most were happy. So this becomes a beautifully moving section. So in her mind, Septimus gets a posthumous military salute. Right, so she uh, goes back and her mind travels back in time uh, to dig up a memory in Venice where she saw a flag waving, uh, some kind of military flag in salutation of a dead soldier. And she evokes that image, her brain evokes the image again and Septimus is a dead soldier who, who exhibits his final act of bravery uh, and his resistance against medical uh, terrorism. Uh, he gets uh, the, the final salute of bravery, the final uh, military salute, the true salute of uh, you know, the military uh, for a true soldier. The Septimus' suicide over here would be seen, should be seen, is seen by Rezia as an act of bravery. But of course, the medical doctors, the, uh, the medical practitioners fail to see it completely and they see it as an act of cowardice, an act of, uh, you know, unmanliness, so to say. But Septimus, in Rezia's mind, gets a final salute of bravery and this becomes a very moving, a very symbolic scene. Uh, and you can see the, the craft of Wolf at play over here. Uh, the lovely descriptions, the density of description, the density of human uh, psychological, the depth of human psychological, um, you know, complexity over here at play. So we, the final image uh, about Septimus is Razia's mind traveling back in time when she was a girl in Venice. She was Italian, uh, and in Venice she sees from a childhood memory. So dig, she digs up something, the flag saluting a dead soldier, the brave dead soldier, and that salute, that flag comes back in her mind now, when her husband, the dead soldier, lies dead, mangled in a post-war city. Of her memories, most were happy. So again, you know, the memory becomes an important thing over here. Most of memories are happy at this time. So there's some kind of a reconciliation over here. So Septimus and and and, and Razia, they they reconciled with Septimus's death. Uh, they, they achieved a sentimental, effective, uh, emotional reconciliation, which is something which the city, the doctors, this war did not allow them to do. So in that sense, uh, we can see the war and the continuation of war, the continuation of battle among us military uh, medical people as some kind of a thing, a function which separates human beings, which makes human beings difficult, more tense, uh, you know, it alienates human beings from each other in that sense. And the dream continues, uh, she put on a hat and ran through cornfields, where could it have been, onto some hill, somewhere near the sea, for there were ships, gulls, butterflies, they sat on a cliff, in London too, there they sat, and half dreaming, came to her to the bedroom door, rain falling, whisperings, stirrings among dry corn, the caress of the sea, as it seemed to her, hollowing them, as it's in its arched cell, and murmuring to her, laid on show, strewn she felt, like flying flowers over some tomb. Right, so the final image of the tomb gives a sepulchral quality to this entire reverie. But we find different markers of beauty and fulfillment, a natural uh, and, um, and abundance, 
Uh, so the, the final image about Septimus in Razor's mind is one of abundance and romantic abundance and fecundity and fertility, right? Things he could not achieve in real life. Uh, you know, they, they, were, they had this almost loveless life in the end, thanks to the medical intervention, thanks to the medical and uh, violence that he was subjected to. He is dead, she said, uh, smiling at the poor old woman who guarded her with her honest light blue eyes fixed on the door. They wouldn't bring him in here, would they? But Mrs. Filmer poo-pooed, oh no, no, they were carrying him away now. Ought she not be told? Married people ought to be together, Mrs. Filmer thought, but it must do as a doctor said. So again, the final, um, the final violence in the, in the medical uh, in the determination is at play over here. Mrs. Filmer is an innocuous man. Uh, she thinks that the wife should, should be told that her husband is dead. The wife should see the final image, the final body of the husband. But the doctor has decided that it's too violent for harm. The doctors decided that you know, they should be separated from each other. Uh, so they must do as the doctor said, right? So again, the word must away carries this very sinister quality of force, of violence, of confinement, of corporeal containment. And that is something which the medical practitioners over here are, are operating, right? So the entire, we can see how the war becomes, uh, it, it gets played on, it gets extended endlessly into all this proxy little battle is carried out by different figures, the doctors being uh, some of the central figures in that proxy battle, right? So they must do as the doctor said. Let her sleep, said Dr. Holmes, feeling her pulse. She saw the large outline of his body standing against the window, so that was Dr. Holmes. So again, this final cinematic image which closes down the Septimus story is a beautiful image and a final image that was a Mr. Doctor guarding that window, right? The, the big body of the male doctor guarding the window, uh, the window which uh, through which this, his, her, her husband exerted or exercised his final act of bravery, his final act of bravery. And Dr. Holmes stands there you know, like an outline of his body standing dark against the window. So he becomes a dark figure, the sinister figure who drives Septimus to this point of desperation. Uh, so Septimus is suicide over here. It's understood by Razia as a final act of bravery uh, as a result of which in her mind, in her reverie, uh, she produces this final salute the military uh, and a salute uh, through a flag that she had seen as a child in Venice onto the dead soldier who happens to be her husband. Okay, now we, we come to an end over here, but just a la last final formal bit uh, in Mrs. Jalloway, which makes it such a wonderful novel in terms of all these different narrators connecting each other at different points of time. Because remember, this is happening in one day in London. All these incidents, everything we see in Mrs. Jalloway, and those of you who read the whole novel would know, this is about a one day novel. It's a very modernist architectonic uh, you know, category style, uh, where everything happens in one calendar day, uh, one journey of the sun. Yeah, and obviously it goes back to the classical traditions of tragedy. Uh, but in this one day, we have different transportations in time. So in, it's, it's the, the superficial one day is not very important. It's a calendar day. Uh, it forms a closure. But within this calendar day, we have different and several and multiple and endless negotiations with time, uh, embodied negotiations with time. Where people go back in time, come back in time, transported in time. So memory becomes a very important marker uh, as a ripple effect across this one day. Uh, and likewise, space too is interconnected. So each of the narratives over here are spatially temporally connected to the other narratives. So Peter Walsh, at this point, he sees the ambulance which takes away Septimus's body, and he looks at the ambulance as a as a signifier of civilization, of philosophy, of treatment, of cure, and that obviously has a dramatic irony about it because we, the readers, know that it's Septimus's dead body taken away uh, by the agents of medical profession who take him away, siphon him off, off uh, presumably to a morgue or to a hospital where he'll be declared dead, classified as dead. To Peter Walsh, the objective outs uh, out, you know, outsider, onlooker over here, that looks like a spectacular uh, you know, success of civilization, which is something that he is uh, you know, congratulating himself about. And this is what he said over here. One of the triumphs of civilization, Peter Walsh thought, it is one of the triumphs of civilization as a light high bell of the ambulance sounded swiftly Cleanly, the ambulance sped up, sped to the hospital, having picked up instantly, humanely, some poor devil, uh, someone hit on the head, struck down by disease, knocked over perhaps a minute or so ago at one of those crossings, as one happened to himself, as might happen to oneself. That was civilization. So this is a classic dramatic irony at play. Uh, this ambulance obviously uh, happens to take Septimus's body, as we know later, but to Peter Walsh, this looks like a siren of civilization, a, a spectacular signifier of civilization. It struck him, coming back from the East, the efficiency, the organization, the communal spirit of London, every part or carriage 
of his own accord drew aside to let the ambulance pass. Perhaps it was morbid, or was it not touching rather the respect which they showed this ambulance which is uh, with his victim inside, busy men hurrying home, yet instantly bethinking them as it passed of some wife, or presumably how easily it might have been them. There, stretched on a shelf with a doctor and a nurse. Ah, but thinking became morbid, sentimental. Directly, one began conjuring up doctors, dead bodies, a little glow of pleasure. A sort of lust too over the visual impression, warned one not to go with that sort of thing anymore. Fatal to art, fatal to friendship. True, and yet, uh, thought Peter Walsh, as the ambulance turned to the corner, uh, though the light high bell could be heard down the next street and still further it crossed the Tottenham Court Road, charming constantly, it's a privilege of loneliness. In privacy, one may do as one chooses. One might sweep, one may weep if no one saw. It had been his undoing. It is susceptibility in anglo Indian society, not weeping at the right time or laughing either. So again, look at the way in which Peter Walsh, like Septimus too, has been a victim of emotional uh, confusion. Uh, he's been unable to laugh at the right, uh, right time. He's been unable to weep at the right time. And that has been his undoing, the susceptibility of not being able to laugh or weep at the right time in the anglo Indian society. So he too is an outsider. He comes back from somewhere. So it's remarkable how all these different men are coming back from somewhere in London. Uh, and, um, uh, Septimus comes back from the war. Peter Walsh comes back from India. And they all feel like outsiders in this post-war uh, metropolis. Okay, uh, I have that in me, he thought, standing by the pillar box, which could now dissolve in tears. Why, heaven knows, beauty of some sort, probably, at the weight of the day, which beginning with that visit to Clarissa, had exhausted him with his heat, its intensity, and the drip, drip of one impression after another, down into the cellar, where it stood, deep, dark, and no one would ever know. Partly for that reason, its secrecy completely and inviolable. He had found life like an unknown garden, full of turns and corners, surprising. Yes, uh, it, it really it took one's breath away. These moments, uh, they come into him by the pillar box opposite the British Museum, one of them, a moment in which things come together, this ambulance and life and death. It was as if he were sucked up to some very high roof by that rush of emotion and the rest of him, like a white shell-sprinkled beach left bare. It had been his undoing in anglo Indian society, this susceptibility. So we have a long passage over here with which I will come to an end. This is uh, the final bit which we will study in Mrs. Jalloway. But the point is, the real crisis in Mrs. Jalloway is an emotional crisis, people not able to emote at the right time. And of course, we find the whole idea of masculinity is engineered not to emote. Uh, it sort of trains men not to emote, right? And that becomes the undoing of someone like Peter Walsh or Septimus Smith. Now, the whole idea of rationality in Mrs. Jalloway is obviously a very tyrannical idea of rationality, one which had historically informed the tyranny of imperialism, where everything must be controlled, classified, coerced, and contained uh, into a production of meaning. And anything which cannot be done in that sequence becomes dysfunctional and meaningless. Right? So, in that sense, Septimus becomes a meaningless person and a meaninglessness of Septimus is obviously part is, is medical, existential, but also cultural. He becomes a meaningless man. He is someone who is liquidated of meaning. Meaning has left him, abandoned him. Right? So, he is one of those abandoned men after the war. The war had moved him, moved from him. So, he becomes essentially a timeless man. There is no space and time for someone like him in London. Right? So, that, that informs the exhaustion of Septimus, the emptiness that he, that he embodies uh, with his uh, disillusion, with his trauma, with his cynicism, with his entire inability to connect to anyone around him. At a less, uh, on, on, on a lesser degree, uh, we, have, we find Peter Walsh too, who is essentially feeling more and more meaningless, having come back from the India, the anglo Indian society. Now, he comes to London, which is the center of the, of the, the, the metropole of the, co the colony, and he finds himself completely unable to connect to the people around him. So again, he finds people around him hyper-rational, he finds people around him emoting at a particular level, and he finds he's unable to go to the same rhythm and find him incompatible uh, with the entire emotional landscape around him. Now, this is how I end Mrs. Jalloway. But the final point is, we look at the novel as something, it's, it's a modernist uh, success, it's a massive modernist success. It's one of the finest uh, novels written in English modernism, uh, and what gives it such a lasting legacy, what gives it such a classic quality today is this magnificent probe into human consciousness, into human emotions, into human behavior, motor behavior, cultural behavior, political behavior, and how those different modes are connected. Right? So, your motor behavior is determined by your political behavior, which in turn uh, determines your gendered behavior and a cultural behavior. And we see how 
the entire engineering of a certain kind of masculinity uh, is a fatal engineering because once it goes wrong, we're left with someone like Septimus who cannot function otherwise because he's been trained to unlearn and undo and unremember so many things such as you know feeling and emotion. He's been trained to distill away those things at all completely clinically. And now that a war is left and he cannot bring back emotions, he cannot feel feel full anymore. He cannot emote and uh, empathize with anyone around him anymore. And therein lies uh, his entire crisis, his entire crisis of embodiment. His crisis of embodiment is actually an emotional crisis. And so, uh, just going back to this final act of suicide, his last act of killing himself against the increasing invasion, the imminent invasion of the doctors, uh, it becomes an act of bravery and a fact of the soldier. So, the soldier comes back in Septimus at the end, as a result of which uh, Arasia gives him this posthumous gift of salute the soldierly salute uh, that uh, she offers in, in her mind uh, but digging up uh, a point in time in a memory uh, through which you know it overlaps to the present and again we see how the temporal quality is so complex the different kinds of overlaps in time happening all the time right so different kinds of space time different kinds of chronotop uh, chronotop being a combination of space and time is uh, term used by Mikhail Bakhtin as I am sure is familiar to most of you, chronob being time and topos is topography of space, a chronotop being a combination of space and time. So, we have in uh, Mrs. Jalloway different kinds of chronotops uh, all interlinked together and this interlinked quality gives this novel a very hyperlinked narrative structure where each narrative crisscrosses with each other narrative at some points of time, the different nodal points in which narratives crisscross each other. So, Peter Walsh is an ambulance uh, sirening away, presumably going up to m pick up Septimus and he has a different, different impression of the ambulance altogether. Uh, Clarissa Dalloway uh, sees Septimus or hears about Septimus and she responds in a particular way as well. So, all these different narratives come together and they do not really inform each other, but they connect to each other in a way it is very organic and harmonious uh, and very human in quality. The randomness of these connections is actually what makes the novel such a human novel and uh, which gives it the lasting legacy and a status of a classic which it so richly enjoys today. So, I end with this uh, and this is how we come to end of Mrs. Jalloway by Virginia Woolf. I hope you took some, uh, we found a uh, you know, series of lectures interesting about this novel and as I mentioned I have a published essay on it which I am happy to upload in the portal for you to read uh, and you know we will move on to different texts in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.